able to be um, the conduit between the elders and the youth and help transmit some of that information. And so we were able to put together exhibits that told our stories. And, I mean, the cool thing about the Inupet Heritage Center is that uh, it's not just the professionals that work at the museum. It's anybody in the community that's a part of a whaling crew they can go in there and bring people around and, and show them the exhibits and, and tell them about it and how it relates specifically to them. And that's really amazing. Um, I think we, we've been very fortunate to, to have that and then also to have people that have a passion in this area um, to, to keep it going, you know. I'm hoping that maybe somebody like my sister or her age group or younger also finds that passion in it and carry it on. And they have that place to go and um, potentially work someday. So, okay, did I answer it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did a good job. <laughs> um, like I mentioned earlier, I mean, you know, my background is with it, growing up within the museum, but it also gave me this perspective. Um, talking to these tourists, I was a really social person growing up, so I... I was like that little girl that followed. <laughs> I was that little girl that followed all these random adults around town. I'd like sometimes if I liked a tourist a lot at the museum, I'd like go to them at the hotel, like at the restaurant there, and be like, "Hey, I saw you today. I was a performer." <laughs> like follow them. Like you want to walk down Front Street? I'll tell you more about God's View. Um, but through that, I talked to them about where they're from, like from all over. Sometimes we had Taiwanese people there. Sometimes people from the East Coast, sometimes from Texas or California. But all of this stuff was like, imagine, like the world was pretty much imaginary to me. And so, of course, as soon as I turned 18, I flew out of Kotsubi as fast as I can. And um, eventually, when I was 20, I went on this, um, I went to school on a ship, basically. I went to semester at sea. Um, we went, we, I met everyone in um, Costa Rica. We ended up sailing, basically, down to Peru. And then we made our way back up. We went up to Ecuador and Belize. We went through the Panama Canal, um, went to Panama, um, went to Costa Rica on the other side, um, on the Atlantic side, and we ended up eventually going up to Florida. But um, that was something I chose to do on myself, and I think it was really influenced by this museum. But the craziest thing happened when I was there. So it was school, so we had classes, and it was summertime. And I signed up for, um, it was a muse music sustainability class, and I took it because I thought we were going to like learn the music of people in Peru or whatever. But um, on the first day, he asked um, our class uh, what we what we think it means to sustain music. Like, what is music sustainability? And all of these people. It was a really awkward silence. It was pretty quiet. But of course, I'm like, um, <laughs> we try our hardest to like sustain our Eskimo dancing and our drum dancing and our singing. And we try to like keep that as alive as we can. And that's something I've learned my whole life to do through this museum. Um, but so, but I didn't say it that greatly or passionately, but I was explaining that I was from Cotsview in Alaska or whatever. And, um, he asked, um, what my, what I identify as or whatever. I said, it's Inupac, or some people call it Eskimo. It's from Kotzebue, North Ostartic. And I didn't look at the syllabus before class started, but it turns out that he had a whole class dedicated to Inupac dancing, and I actually didn't realize um, until Kwiana night last week um, when you were hosting and I was watching, and the... Um, sorry, I can't remember what the Barrow Dance Group was, but um, in the introduction, they ended up mentioning that they the, these songs came back. They were recording from like the 40s or the 50s or something along those lines. Um, that was what our class was to be that day, like uh, like literally on the like on a ship in the Pacific where I knew absolutely nobody. He wanted he had articles and he had stuff about this professor from Columbia University that recorded in Barrow in the 40s and 50s, and she ended up passing away. And in the academic world, she owned those recordings, but people were like, she doesn't own the recordings. Barrow own, Utkiagvik owns these recordings. And they went, it was like, we were reading about, like, what does it mean to, like, get, so we were talking about how they brought this all back, and it was just, like, this trippy experience where I was like, I'm Inupac, I grew up Inupac dancing, but I've never thought of it from an academic sense 
let alone like in the Pacific Ocean with random people. So he ended up letting me like take over the class. He's like, well, you're any back, so you might as well just teach this class today. <laughs> like I didn't, we didn't have internet. I was like in Ecuador at like McDonald's Wi-Fi trying to get like songs off YouTube. <laughs> it was such an experience. So like talk about importance of media and like native and like social media and like the access that you have. Like I literally found I like ripped music off of YouTube in Ecuador to be able to teach this class. But it was interesting to go through that whole series of the class and realize um, that I had become a tourist um, and I was looking at communities like a lot poorer than I am and they used their culture a lot to be able to get, basically make money off of us. And it was an interesting thing to go through and process and... Um, when I presented in that class and I talked with that class, during that presentation, there was kind of like a reluctance and like a resistance because at this point I was 20. So at that point, there was about eight years of that museum not existing in Kotzebue. And sometimes I wonder like, what if that museum didn't close down? What if they didn't stop those shows that I, while I was going through my teenage years, like I would have gone to that class a lot stronger and had like a lot more foundation because I had, I would have been going through that the routine of the shows that we had that you eventually, like, you kind of grow up through. Um, and so it makes me think of the, like, being here in Anchorage and in the city and how there's multiple generations now that are leaving for education and they're starting to settle a lot more into these urban areas. And so moving to the city and raising a family in the city and children in the city, they have to have a sense of community with their native people still. And it's like, how do you create that atmosphere th for them? Like, how do you create that space for them? And I feel like a museum is um, a good way to start. And like that relationship building of realizing that we do have two different communities that exist here in Anchorage, which is the native community. And um, it is like with the Denina and, um, the na the actual natives from this land, but it's also a really growing population of natives from across Alaska, and that's something that we have to tend to and um, empower. Um, that's interesting that they they had the recordings, right? And um, it reminds me of the history of taking from native communities and putting these things into museums. Is there? Can you guys speak a little bit about that and? I was looking at you, Melissa, because... <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, I think a really important part of what museums need to think about today is their collections and about the transparency of how the collections entered into their hands and who owns it today, owns, and then also who, who has access to it. Right. You know, I think that um, there's a lot of museums, you know, Anchorage Museum included, uh, who are doing work to make collections accessible at every um, basically every request to look at things, you know. I mean, but I do think that we suffer still from like this idea, well, it belongs in a museum, right? That Indiana Jones quote, right? <laughs> and I think that uh, a lot of times we look at things and, and what it is that we're deciding to collect upon with that idea in mind, being that museums actually have, um, have the highest standard of caring for things. But actually, I think that we probably would care for things in a different way. They belong in our hands and they belong in, in, in our villages, you know, where, where they come from. You know, I did this project, uh, actually here at the museum where I brought objects that were Atna, Diné heritage, Athabascan heritage to, back to Golcana, Copper Center, and, and, um, Tazalina. And we did like a pop-up exhibit and it was, it was, a really, I would say, uh, a project that had a lot of questions, you know, it's like, well, what's the purpose? Like, what is, what, what risk is it to these objects, you know, for us to, you know, let you do this, you know, and how is it that we're going to protect these things? You know, what, what purpose? Why, why does this need to happen? 
you know, and we got there and we unloaded everything, put them up in the little exhibit and people were looking at them. And there was a lady who um, was looking at uh, these moccasins and she was looking at them. She was touching them and, you know, and um, she's like, you know, this beadwork looks really familiar. She's like, this is just really something about it. And uh, the collection staff that I had brought with me, in their very collections way, brought every record and like information available on the on the object and uh, the moccasins. And she read off the name of the artist, and she's like, "That's my grandma," you know. And she was in probably in her her sixties or so, you know. So you you see like three or four generations just like within that. And then she showed her granddaughter her grandma's slippers, you know. And it just solidified for me that. These objects that we have, these collections that we have, they deserve to live in our, our lives. You know, they don't, des- they don't need to live beyond our lives. Their, their greatest purpose is to educate our people today. You know, and I think that we need to find ways that collections can be more accessible, you know, in ways that aren't, that aren't fully giving them back. You know, there's lots of projects of, like, uh, um, repatriation, like, with digital things. You know, it's like, oh, well, let's repatriate this, you know, 3D model of something rather than the actual object. And it's like, well, actually, you could just give that back. (laughs) All this fun that you have to, funds you have to, to, to 3D model this, to print it, could actually go to an artist to replicate it if you want it so badly in your museum. You know, I think that we need to, like, we need to be critical of those things. We also don't need to accept what the museum will give us. We can tell them what it is that we need back. We can tell them what it is that's important to us because we are <laughs> we are the experts, and you know it's it's our knowledges are not biased in these ideas and these these situations. You know, and I think that um, that we need to find ways to continue to talk about that and talk about how these things belong in our hands. If we just like think about what's humane and what's just in something that we're holding, we're going to be guided in the right way. You know, you just have to think about the humanity. Stop stop removing us and distancing us from the human aspect that we have because we know that these objects are alive. We know that the collections, you know, have a deeper meaning and purpose and I think that museums and us as well need to be vocal about those things. So uh, I just wanted to add some information about what you had mentioned regarding the Inupiaq songs. That was actually Aaron Fox, uh, who uh, it was him and his team that had traveled, he's from Columbia University, traveled to Utqayaravik to work with um, giving back those songs, the ownership of those songs and the copyright of those songs back to the community, back to the tribe. And I um, I hadn't even really thought about copyright until he came and was ready to give it back. And I'm like, well, we already know we own it, you know? <laughs> like, no, 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 but this is like, you know, legally. And I was like, okay, well, what's the benefit of that? And he said, well, you know, artists regularly come to look at collections and to get, you know, they get inspired. What would you do if Lady Gaga sampled some of this, at, like, for her next hit single? And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, well, that makes sense. But um, so it's Aaron Fox, if anybody's interested in learning more about that. He's on Facebook, uh, and he's always um, willing to help out if, you know, if, I, if anyone is doing a research project. But I did want to say um, regarding repatriation, NAGPRA, that sort of thing, uh, that's a hot-button subject, and different institutions are at different degrees of um, cooperation with communities to give things back. Um, I I will say that the Smithsonian is actually exempt from giving anything back. And, um, you know, what can you do, right? Well, I do want to mention that uh, of a really cool story or project that had happened regarding Smithsonian collections. Um, There was a filmmaker, Bernadette Dean from Nunavut, Canada. She's actually one of my friend's moms. And... What she did was she um, developed a cohort of elders and took them to different um, 
museums, Smithsonian in particular, uh, in the lower 48, and she asked to see these collections. They, they were willing to share them, all of these certain collections that were from Nunavut. And she had these elders review these collections, and she recorded it all. And these elders may have not seen these things.